My name is Micah Pollack, and I'm here to talk to you today about animated lecture slides. And in a few uh, sessions ahead, you're going to see one of my colleagues and friends, Dr. Jose Vasquez, talk about how you should get rid of these kind of boring lecture slides in your class and replace them with flipped classrooms. And I'm going to argue kind of something a little different. I'm going to try to argue that instead of completely eliminating these slides, we might actually be able to make them better and get a lot more value out of them. And so um, there's a kind of this long history of a love-hate relationship, I think, with uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, people use them um, sometimes because they have to, right? I mean, if I asked any of you to get up and do a quick 10-minute you know, talk about demand on a chalkboard, probably all of you could do that. And your talks would probably be very similar without any preparation. That's because we're familiar with using chalkboards, right? That's how we learn. That's how the subject teaches the material primarily. And so we're very comfortable with it, and you know, we're used to it. And we think students are used to it and like it as well. But the problem is sometimes you can't use a chalkboard, right? It might be that you have a really large enrollment class, or maybe you're teaching an online class, and there's just no physical chalkboard available. And so kind of the next logical step is to maybe consider PowerPoint. And this is kind of where all the trains derail a little bit, because you get into PowerPoint, you open it up, you have a nice blank canvas, you start drawing things, and then you know, what happens, you discover the animation tab, and there are hundreds of animations, and you, 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 you subtly try to include every animation in your presentation or something like that, and, and it gets kind of out of hand. And so um, there's a couple views about using animations in, in PowerPoint's presentations, and one kind of extreme view is that all animations are good and animations can do no wrong. And so this would be kind of like your first to foray into PowerPoint slides, and you see all the animation uh, options and you go a little crazy and if you're presenting something like supply and demand your presentation might look something like this where you've got you know, things popping in and all sorts of neat flying in effects and you know all sorts of stuff coming in from different sides and you're using every animation possible on one screen um, you know stuff like this uh, and it starts to distract a little bit from what you're actually trying to teach soon it's just about you know what kind of cool animations can I include rather than hey are they actually learning supply and demand Right? And if you look at this kind of a slide, uh, it's hard to tell if the students are really getting anything other than the fact that you like a lot of things moving and you like a lot of color. And so it's kind of exciting maybe, but they're not really getting any actual material out of it. Right? Any kind of underlying message is lost, kind of buried in all these things kind of shouting at you. And so that's kind of the first experience a lot of people have with animating lecture slides. Unfortunately, you get a lot of backlash from animations like this. Um, you know, it's usually bad practice, and so you get kind of the opposite extreme view after this, which is animations can do no good at all. And so the reverse of this is, you know, you, you, you don't like all these animations, and so you instead put up something like this, where it just kind of appears, and it's everything that you're going to talk about in kind of one static picture. And I'd argue that this is not necessarily much better, because honestly, they might as well go read the textbook, right, if they're doing, if you're looking at this. I mean, sure, you can kind of illustrate, okay, we're starting here, and then we're going to move here. But it's so static that they're not going to actually get that information uh, and understand it well. And so um, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is how you can use animations as a kind of a happy medium between these two. There's times when they can be really helpful and they can actually do better than you would be able to do with a chalkboard. But you also have to be careful not to venture kind of too far in one extreme or the other. And so there's actually kind of two types of animations I like to talk about. And the first one is the one that I think most people are more familiar with, which is animations that are for effect or to grab your attention. Right, this is what we saw in that first slide, right? All the animations were just shouting at you, essentially. So things like this. And these things have uses, right? If you want to direct your student's attention to a particular area of the slide or something like that, then they're useful. But if you make all of your animations and every object that appears on your slide scream out for attention, they're very quickly going to become indefinite by uh, all these animations. Unfortunately, this is the type of animation most people use in their PowerPoints. Right? They have something pop in, they have something fade in, fly in, bounce in, who knows. Um, and these things tend to grab attention. The other type of animation, which is a little bit more subtle and a lot more powerful, is animations that actually simulate real movement or motion that has meaning in the, con in the context of economics. So if you have something that's actually moving for a reason, not because you need to get it on the screen, but because it's representing something else happening. And so this second kind of uh, animation is the one that most people don't use very often, but can be a very powerful tool. So um, when you're lecturing with a chalkboard, the students see you drawing supply and demand. They see you drawing the axes. They see you drawing the demand curve. They see you fill in the points. 
And this gets repeated over and over throughout the semester every time you draw supply and demand. With a PowerPoint presentation, often it just kind of pops up and then that's it, they move on. And so what you can do with PowerPoints is kind of simulate the chalkboard experience a little bit using some of these animations. So if I was to you know, show a supply and demand graph over and over in my class, rather than just having it kind of appear there, what I can do is actually draw it in as though I was you know, doing it on a chalkboard. You can even put a little pencil if you want that kind of goes along and draws in the elements. And so it draws in demand just like I would on the chalkboard. Draws in supply just like I would on the chalkboard. Puts in equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity, and so on. And by doing it kind of one element at a time in kind of a controlled way, rather than just having things kind of fall out of the sky and land there, right? you can reinforce to the students how they can, on a sheet of paper, on their own, draw these kind of diagrams and models. The other really nice thing about PowerPoint is that you can actually do things that you can't do on a chalkboard that will help uh, students understand the concepts better. So if we were to increase demand and show the effect of that on a chalkboard, you'd probably draw in a new demand curve, draw in the new equilibrium point, quantity, price, and then spend some time talking about, okay, how do we go from the first to the second and what changes. But with PowerPoint, you can actually do a little bit better than that. You can actually show the change as it happens. It's not one static shot to the other, but from one to the other. And so when demand increases, you can actually show it increasing. And then they understand how, okay, price and quantity are linked to the shift in demand. And they can actually see the whole process taking place. And by the way, they can come back later if you post your slides and look it over again, right? So they can go back and, and see exactly how demand shifts. And this will kind of enhance their learning because now they're actually able to see it not just as two static pictures, but as a transition from one to the other. Uh, there's two other kind of big methods I like to use uh, for animations in, in my classes. And the first is to get a deeper understanding of very simple concepts. So, you know, demand curve is a very basic concept. You know, first, second week, usually we're talking about demand curves. But demand curves are actually very complicated things. And there are a lot of assumptions underlying them. We often kind of gloss over these assumptions, or maybe, depending on your textbook, you have a list of you know, the seven assumptions underneath the demand curve. And for the students, it's just a list to memorize, really. But what you can do with kind of animations is tell a story. And as you tell the story, you can integrate these assumptions. And you don't even necessarily need to tell them that they're assumptions. But as long as they kind of think about the topic from the perspective of the story, then they'll automatically include these assumptions. So I just want to show you a brief example of how you might introduce demand. And so probably like a lot of you, when I talk about demand, I, I bring up a good, some kind of good like maybe a hamburger. And then I go around the room and ask students, oh, how much would you pay for this hamburger? How much would you pay for this hamburger? And they all come back with different you know, values and we get to make fun of the kind of the meat eaters and the vegetarians and, and things like that. Um, but then what I do is I take five kind of hypothetical people and I put them in here. And the students can kind of relate to these people because we just went around and talked about values or the willingness to pay. And we give them different willingnesses to pay. And again, they can relate to these because they just went through this exercise themselves. And so now you've got kind of a very real world example, real world setup, and you can slowly transition to a demand curve. So now that we have these five people, we can go from our real world example to uh, something closer to a demand model where we have a graph paper where we put you know, price or willingness to pay on one axis and quantity on the other. And they still have the connection to the real world in the example that we did before. And then the next step is we can kind of rearrange them a little bit. Right? We need to kind of sort them by order from highest willingness to pay to lowest. And then we actually have our demand curve. And we've made it all the way to the demand curve kind of sneakily before the students even realized it. Right? And we can put in a price. So here's the price of hamburgers. And then as we lower the price, we can determine who would buy the hamburger. So now John would pick up the hamburger at $10. If it goes lower, then John and Dennis buy. Then John, Dennis, and Sue as we kind of lower the price. And so it makes a strong connection from the initial example all the way through to the actual demand curve itself. And we have our demand curve. Now, most students, when they see this demand curve, the first thing we do is pretty much try to make them forget it and start drawing a straight line demand curve. And sometimes they for don't understand how we go from this kind of a stepped curve where we only have five people to the demand curve for the whole market. And so animations can help a little bit there uh, as we start thinking about bringing in other people, right? So here's four more people. We bring them in, we kind of squeeze them into the demand curve, and it looks a little less bumpy. And as we keep going, we just keep on bringing more and more people in. And as they kind of come in, the demand curve gets less and less bumpy and less and less like steps, more and more 
like a smooth line. And before you know it, we're to the demand curve that we're originally trying to get to, which is a nice smooth line that represents the whole market demand here. And so with this story, the students can kind of go back and see how each step happens along the way, and they have some tools for understanding why we're going from one step to the other. And maybe you didn't realize, but there's actually three assumptions that we went over in here without even actually telling you that they were assumptions. But as long as you remember the story, these assumptions will kind of come out naturally. For example, that the demand curve is composed of individuals like you and I. Or this is a huge assumption that we often don't talk about. We order demand so that the highest value consumers get the good first. This becomes a big issue when you talk about government intervention, price ceilings, price floors, and the efficiency of those, because we often kind of gloss over the fact that when there's not enough quantity, the supply and demand model assumes you give the goods to the highest value consumers, right? which is a major assumption that rarely we even talk about. And also the assumption that we have a large number of consumers. And sure, you can give them a list of assumptions, but if they can see kind of in the story where these assumptions fit in, they're going to remember it a lot better than just memorizing the list. So it's useful for something as simple as demand or basic as demand to get a deeper understanding. It's also helpful for more complex topics. So one of my favorite parts of each semester when I teach principles of micro is near the end when we've kind of put all the tools together, or we're about, we have them all ready to put together, and we're going to go back and we're going to look at the market, perfectly competitive market, and individual firms' decisions and kind of put all those pieces together. And so we have you know, a graph where we show the market supply and demand. So this would be a perfectly competitive market. Again, notice I'm kind of drawing them in as though I was using a chalkboard. And so you've got your, your market on one side. And then on the other side, you have the individual firm's cost curves. And so we put in average total cost, uh, marginal cost, things like that. And the students are pretty familiar with each of these kind of tools separately. Right? They're familiar with how supply and demand works. They're familiar now with average total costs and decision making by firms. And now we're going to take them and put them together. And so really, it shouldn't be that hard. But many students struggle with this because all of a sudden, you have two graphs. And things can change in both. And how does that kind of go from one to the other? And so what we can do is we, we first kind of bring it over and say, OK, look, the price in the market is going to be the marginal revenue for the individual firm. And so at that marginal revenue uh, level, they're going to choose profit maximizing marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And they're going to get a firm individual quantity, Q1. This, at this point, they're mostly OK with it. Right? The problem arises when we start doing things to this model, and it becomes very complicated to have both of these two tools that individually they're used to, but maybe together they're not. So for example, if we wanted to increase demand or decrease demand, right, there's going to be implications of, on the individual market side too. But how exactly do they change? Well, again, you could do it in a very static way, draw on a new demand curve, draw on a new uh, marginal revenue, say what happens on the firm side. But why do that when you've got kind of this magic PowerPoint paper here where you can actually animate it? So if we're actually going to shift demand and supply here, as you shift demand, you can see what's happening to marginal revenue over on the individual firm side. And you can see how as the, the marginal revenue drops, the firm responds by choosing a new output to keep marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. You can notice on the bottom the quantity over in the market is shifting by a lot. Because remember, there's lots of firms behind the demand curve and supply curve here. And over on the left, it's only switching by a small amount because it's just one individual firm. And so by seeing this and being able to kind of go over it later, so I do an example for all four, demand decreasing, increasing, supply decreasing, increasing. They can actually see kind of how these tools, the, the cogs of the machine actually work um, in real time kind of smoothly. And you can do things like stick in minimum average total cost so that when you know, the marginal revenue drops below that, then the firm exits. And when it's above it, they're earning economic profits, and firms want to enter the market. And so you can do a lot of these really dynamic, powerful uh, learning tools that you can't necessarily do with a blackboard and um, just kind of a static pictures. And so when you're using animations in PowerPoint, they can be really beneficial. But you have to kind of walk a fine line between, on one side, having the very boring, static, kind of fixed uh, presentations, which essentially they could get from the textbook. And on the other side, kind of going too much into the animations. Uh, I love that PowerPoint actually has an animation that randomly picks an animation to do the animation. So that's kind of like <laughs> the epitome of too much animation, right? And so you don't want to be obnoxious, confusing, or anything like that. And you really you know, have the chance to make your presentation be exciting, memorable, and improve their retention and their understanding of the material if it's done right. And it's not just all kind of yelling at them. <laughs> 